Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring the phenomenon of levitation, and in particular, the life of the flying friar, St. Joseph of Copertino. My guest, Michael Grosso, is a philosopher. He is the author of The Man Who Could Fly, St. Joseph of Copertino, and The Mystery of Levitation. In addition, he has written a commentary called The Wings of Ecstasy on Domenico Bernini's V of St. Joseph of Copertino, originally written in 1722. His other books include The Final Choice, Death or Transcendence, Experiencing the Next World Now, Frontiers of the Soul, The Millennium Myth, Love and Death at the End of Time, Soul Making, Uncommon Paths to Self-Understanding, and Soul Maker, True Stories from the Far Side of the Psyche. In addition, he's a co-editor of a very important anthology called Irreducible Mind, Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. This interview is being conducted via the Internet, so now I'll switch over to the Skype video. Welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you. And the, the subject of levitation, in particular, uh, St. Joseph of Copertino, is, is fascinating. It opens up so many doors into the physics of levitation or the parapsychology of religious experience. Uh, you've been really exploring his life history for a long time now, for I, th I think a few years. A couple of years, yes, I would say. And I knew about him and I had read about him. So I'm not the first one to announce the fact that this guy could do these things. Uh, but uh, I wanted to get deeply into it. And that's what I've done. It, it seems to be amongst all of the cases of Catholic saints and all the miracles that they are alleged to have performed, this this uh, case stands out because, first of all, it's relatively recent, uh, mm -hmm. attested to by hundreds of, of witnesses, and uh, he became uh, beatified after an extensive uh, review by the church itself. That's right. And it took a while because uh, at first they were a little uh, put off by the strangeness and extremeness of the of the of the levitations. In particular, the fact that Joseph had a tendency to levitate backwards. And that seemed so odd and, distra and distressing to people who were wit witnessing him. Mm -hmm. But then he explained that the backward levitations were a sign of honoring something that was so amazing that he was just humbled. Mm -hmm. and he backed away uh, and showing, therefore, that just the thought of backing away enabled the process, inexplicable as it is, to take place. I'm I'm not aware of any other instance in the uh, list of saints of the Catholic Church of uh, so many levitations over so many years. I think you're right. I, I mean, there, there's a pro <clears throat> at least 150 other Catholic saints, uh, according to Herbert Thurston, who's an expert on this, where you have uh, decent evidence, eyewitness testimony. But the same author points out that nobody comes close to Joseph. And I want to stay right, right up front. It was not only the levitations that he was famous for, but a whole uh, bunch of other paranormal phenomena. And in particular, perhaps the key to the whole story was his amazing disposition to be ecstatic, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which is kind of... <laughs> radical going out of your body, so to speak. Uh, but uh, th those two, you know, when you read about mystics, you often hear that some were highly evolved in terms of their 
uh, let's say, expanded states of consciousness, their mystical states, uh, the ecstatic openness uh, uh, to reality. And then you sometimes hear stories of saints who had one or two uh, uh, bouts of paranormal phenomena. Joseph is the only one that I know of who was preeminent in both fields, the mystical modes of consciousness and what we call uh, the paranormal, what the church called charisms or gifts, and uh, or the Hindus called siddhis, special mm-hmm. powers, you see, but the same idea is present. So this is one reason why I was especially attracted to Joseph, that he seemed to uh, be uh, extraordinarily evolved in both regions of consciousness uh, interest to scholars of today, the mystical and the paranormal. Levitation is it strikes me as a very, very rare phenomenon. I've never witnessed levitation in, in my lifetime, and I've witnessed many other uh, forms of psi. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, what does your study suggest to you? How, how common is this? Well, as I said, among the saints, many reports of levitation, and there's a huge uh, visual record of of uh, levitation among uh, Tibetan Buddhists. And there's a book by um, uh, Glenn Mullen, which is enthralling because it's got just pages of go- going back to the 17th century, fascinating artwork that illustrates uh, all kinds of levitations. Unfortunately, we don't have that many eyewitness testimonies, mm-hmm. uh, but nevertheless, it's in the tradition. Mm-hmm. The other thing I would say is that uh, levitation of the body is one thing, but levitation of objects, of tables, for example, that we see in uh, in, in, in mediumship. Uh, we see various manifestations, what we would call levitation among poltergeists. And also, there's an extensive literature, that one that we tend to avoid because it's kind of creepy, stuff about possession. If you read Brian Levac's amazing book, the Devil Within, History of, of um, Possession in the Christian West, he, although he's not looking at all, as I am, and as you might be curious about these phenomena, he admits that among the possessed in the, in the massive work that, he'd done, that he had done, uh, there are many, many reasons to doubt the reality of, of, of levity, but he could not. He concluded that he had to say that there were so many reports of possessed people that behaved in strange uh, aerial ways, that he had to admit that it was uh, part of the whole syndrome. So actually, there's quite a bit more uh, going on uh, in the realm of uh, of levitation. And then there are, in in my case, I had uh, several experiences, and one in particular, uh, which convinced me of the reality of levitation, in which, I mentioned this in the book, uh, a colleague and I in a team taught class on human development, uh, did various things such as uh, meditating and chanting together, and one of the students recommended that we try a levitation experiment uh, based on a, a kid's game called light as a feather, that apparently lots and lots of people, when you start talking to them about it, they will remember that they were, when they were kids, they did this. I knew nothing of it. So instead, I suggested, all right, let's do it right now in our class. And I didn't expect any results. Uh, I did not expect the results. But I picked the heaviest guy in the class, a 200-pound ex-Marine. And I got four of the frailest-looking young women in the class. And all they did was touch him, just touch him. They didn't cup him in any way. They merely touched him at uh, each girl uh, on underneath the knee and underneath the elbow, and we did a little chanting together, and then I said, lift. Now I'll be darned. Uh, he went up into the air, and as I, I repeatedly say, I will never forget the look of utter astonishment on the face of this young man as he went up in the air. And then very gently, it only lasted a few seconds, down he came. There was another professor in the room that witnessed it, and an entire class of about 35 people. So I call that levitation. Hmm. It's levitation with contact. But 
there is no way they could have looked at that guy the way I was watching them. I mm -hmm. saw what they did. There was no effort, no effort whatsoever. Up he went. And I've done other experiments with groups of people uh, involving uh, levitation of tables several times, striking examples of where the table took off. I had to chase after uh, it to keep my hands on it. So I came to the project with a, a sense of um, confidence, also having read into the literature. But uh, so it is not quite as vanishingly rare as one might think, but, mm. but it is on the whole uh, rare. I've also run into uh, accounts of the people who've written me. Uh, one guy told me that he fell off a boat and uh, he was with several other people. <laughs> In the falling, he suddenly felt himself slow up. And the witnesses on the boat noticed that it, somehow the gravitation just stopped for a few seconds, gave him enough time to grab him and save him. I've had several stories like that. So under crises, currently, there can be these strange uh, suspensions of gravity that are occasionally reported. Not quite as dramatic as, as Joseph sailing up 31 feet into the air to take hold of a uh, of a painting of the Madonna, but still interesting stuff. And, and I uh, seem to recall now that Joseph sometimes would remain in the air for uh, a period of time. That's right. He didn't only just go up. And uh, I would say my readings, uh, uh, the total, you know, readings of what I've m made out, he frequently stayed for like 15 minutes at a time, on occasions, hours. Uh, those are rare. And by the way, other, other reports of other Catholic saints also talk about prolonged periods of, of elevation. And uh, uh, Lambertini, who did the study, who became the later the Pope, uh, 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 later the Pope, yes, Benedict the Fourteenth, he uses the expression prolonged flights, and this was a particular investigator who was highly rationalistic, and that's why it took so long to get uh, Joseph beatified because there was the strangeness, not because they doubted the reality of the phenomena, but because it was too weird to really make sense of and fit into the traditional patterns of levitation. I, I understand that um, Lambertini, who became Pope Benedict XIV, uh, mm -hmm. really made uh, quite a few contributions to the scientific study of phenomenon of, of this type. He did, and, and uh, some of that material is uh, hard, hard to get your hands on, but he was emphatically looking for naturalistic expl explanations. However, where I would agree, disagree with Lambertini, he thought that pure levitation without any, you know, gimmicks attached to it uh, had to be supernatural. I don't believe that. I believe that this, uh, uh, these effects, these anti-gravitational effects are part of a process that we just don't understand. Mm. And, uh, it, uh, and there are some, you know, guesses that we can begin to make to hopefully explain them, but at least to the person who's witnessing the experience and to a pious person within a religious belief system, they will certainly seem as though only a divine being caused this to happen, but I, I myself don't accept that interpretation, but I'm nonetheless deeply impressed by the phenomenon. That levitation is, is natural, not supernatural. Yes, but unknown. I mean, just as uh, I don't think any, not too many of us believe that ESP in general is an automatic indicator of the supernatural, but rather it is a facet of our uh, natural endowments that we don't fully understand yet. Mm -hmm. It is consistent, of course, with religious beliefs because it seems that it's an extra physical agency or force yeah. that's doing the trick. Well, levitation is so unusual that uh, skeptics often feel entitled just to dismiss it out of hand. And I know you've had that experience yourself with one reviewer of your book. Yes, I, I did. Uh, I, I've had about so far five or six very good reviews and not one of them 
has even raised the question of the authenticity. Uh, but uh, uh, Joe Nickel, as we we know, he's a uh, so-called um, uh, critic, skeptic, and I I deny the term the beautiful Greek word skeptic to apply to him because a skeptic is someone who suspends judgment and inquires. A skeptic is not a disbeliever. And I was, someone called attention to the fact that um, this gentleman wrote a review of my book. I dug it up and there was no review. All he did was use one ad hominem comment and say the entire period of time was superstitious. He used that word twice. And basically then tried to come up with a fantastic idea that um, Joseph was a covert um, gymnast who had trained himself to jump in the air and hang on things and do all kinds of marvelous things that would uh, gave the impression of being levitation. In short, that he was basically a liar and a scam. And uh, the only trouble with that, and he also made this ridiculous claim in this non-review, that how he got his muscles so strong was by praying hours on end to the point where he would, his knees would, would get, get welts on them. Now, I'd like to know how does that uh, figure you, you don't build up the muscles by, by standing on, uh, on your knees uh, and praying. Uh, on the contrary, that would have the opposite effect. Uh, it wouldn't develop anything. So it's complete nonsense. He also hinted that he may have had springboards and used devices that are used by clowns in the Middle Ages to jump around. It's a really pathetic indication of what somebody will attempt to do to deny something that he doesn't believe is true. And it's so utterly ridiculous. Well, the first person to tell me about this review was a friend of mine. He's a professor of religious studies at Princeton uh, University. And it was a joke. When he told me the story, we both broke out into laughter. It was hilarious because that attempt to explain it away is so utterly devoid of value. So, uh, I'm, by the way, I wrote uh, a little critique of this uh, response, uh, and I sent it to the author, and I sent it to the journal, uh, The Skeptical Inquirer, and I said, I hope you'll give me a chance to reply to your criticism of my, of my book. And, of course, I was being sarcastic, because I know that they wouldn't. And sure enough, no response from either of them. There is no response. With regard to Joseph, I think it's important to look at what kind of a person he was. I understand, for example, he wasn't particularly well educated. No, it, it, I should say something about his um, life and, and his times, because it's hard to take him out of the world that he was living in 17th century Europe during the uh, Reformation. It was a period of tremendous conflict a period of psychic dissociation in so many different senses. I mean, there was the breakdown, the scientific revolution is taking place, uh, the conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics was taking place, and there were economic matters. If you look into the history, people were, uh, rather like today in some respects, uh, under tremendous economic pressures. So the whole fabric of 17th century society in Europe, and particularly in Italy, was undergoing uh, all kinds of disturbing changes. So this was reflected in Joseph's uh, life and his family. He was quite literally born in a stable, or a, uh, a, a yeah, a stable is the only translation, stala. The reason is, his father was on the lamb from debt collectors, his mother, who was a rather dour, uh, very religious but unsympathetic woman, was forced to give birth to Joseph in a stable. She had no petition, so they were homeless, uh, um, impoverished, and very early on, from the age 7 to 11, uh, Joseph uh, became bedridden 
with a sickness that, that for five years left him in acute pain. And it was like a, a gangrenous tumor that, that, that grew. And so I think that was an important part of his beginnings as a shaman, mystic saint, because as we all know, uh, at least some of us, uh, very often unusual uh, things happen when people get sick, as they do when people have near-death experiences, a more dramatic illustration of getting sick. And my guess is that while Joseph was bedridden for those five years and impoverished and abused, almost abused by his mother, that the only thing he had going for him was prayer and meditation. And it turns out that he had a knack for that. And he had a knack for getting deeply engrossed in his prayers, so engrossed that his mouth would open and he'd look like an idiot. And some of the kids who got to know him and observe him nicknamed him Boca Perta, which means gaping mouth. And from that came the impression, and even in the literature, that somehow Joseph started out as mentally retarded. That's incorrect. He was not the reader type or the intellectual type. He was definitely what we would call a right brain sort of person. But what would happen is any sound of music or anything that suggested the sacred would cause him to slip into an altered state of consciousness. And so uh, the whole beginning of his life, and, and when he finally got healed, and no one knows how, by the way, mysteriously the disease just went away, uh, he tried to uh, earn a living, first as a shoemaker, and uh, he was a failure, a complete failure. He just was so distracted, he was unable to concentrate on anything. And he even managed to get into an early, uh, into one convent for about eight months. And uh, he was a complete failure there because he would drop things, spill things, when he would listen to the music, he would go off into his ecstatic states and he was like untouchable or unreachable. So they concluded that he was a complete moron and utterly unfit for the church and they just kicked him out. So it was only his mean-spirited mother who stuck to him and eventually got him into a Franciscan order. Uh, and... He became a priest. This is a very interesting part of the story. You know, in order to become a priest, he had to know something about the church, about doctrine, about he had to know some Latin. He was hopeless in those areas. So there were two tests that he had to take. And in both tests, coincidentally, interpreted by Joseph as a miraculous intervention of Mother Mary, but from the outside point of view, it looks like Coincidentally, uh, he was he made it through as a priest. In the first coincidence, he was asked to comment on the one passage that he knew something about that had something to do with the Madonna uh, and and her immaculate nature or something. I forget exactly, but he was asked that, and he was able to speak rather intelligibly about it. On the second, which would have been the harder test for him to pass, when it came to him to, about to be tested, the gentleman, the priest, the, the superior who was doing the test said, look, everyone so far on this list has done superlatively well. I don't see any point in keeping the rest of you guys waiting. You're, out, you're all passed. And Joseph did not have to face that test. And he was automatically made into a priest. And he automatically assumed that the Madonna was responsible for that lucky break that he had. So that it wasn't a coincidence. It was an intervention. Who knows? But that's how he suddenly became a priest. So that's pretty much the little beginnings of his background. Uh, and uh, the moment he became a priest, it was as though he had licensed then to do the things that a religious is supposed to do. And he fasted and he lacerated himself and he began to levitate after he became a priest. Ecstasy he had before. Now the ecstasies evolved into levitations. And it might be worth mentioning 
that the first time he did levitate, which was in Brotella, uh, sort of near his hometown, he was contemplating a painting of the Madonna and the child. So that image was one of the most powerful. He became deeply attached to that image, and when he was forced to leave 16 years later, he actually missed the painting because it was his... It was like a love token for him, you know. So um, anyway, that's just a rough uh, account of his uh, of his beginnings, uh, and uh, and how he became a priest, and how he gradually evolved. Now, uh, my understanding is uh, that he was so devout, and as you mentioned, lacerated himself to the point where he developed infections and i understand it's it seems paradoxical because on the one hand i've heard he smelled awful because of these infections and on the other hand people reported he had a a sweet smell because he was such a holy person right right well you know i've never actually heard that they smelled his uh uh wounds but they may very well have done so that Mm -hmm. when they left of course that was the end of that but as far as the uh, alleged uh, or reported uh, uh, odor of sanctity, as it's called, there's a chapter in the biography of Joseph's uh, uh, life uh, by Bernini, uh, which reviews case after case of, of vivid, totally convincing examples, illustrations of, of people from all walks of life saying that anything that Joseph touched of theirs would retain these mysterious, uh, really transcendent fragrances that they couldn't even place them. They even had uh, benefits on their mental state and their physical state. And that these effects would last, but not just for days or hours, but sometimes for months and even years. Allegedly, his room, after he left it, kept that smell or kept aspects of it uh and kept those uh, divine fragrances for several years after he left so i often thought about that a guy who never probably took showers or changed his underwear he must have you know been awful to even to himself but there was no sign of that Mm -hmm. and his body and his anything he touched seemed to irradiate a fragrance and that, to my mind, is almost as puzzling as levitation. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the it's the ex nihilo creation of an odor, which is normally odors have physical basis, and uh, so that's another one of the strange facets mm-hmm. of Joseph's uh, paranormal abilities. Well, I gather he became quite famous uh, in his own lifetime, almost like a rock star, uh, <laughs> for his saintly phenomena. Yeah, he did, as a matter of fact, and and I, I often thought of writing a little paper on him, a very early victim of fame. That's a, a kind of a trope of modern times, and many people, famous people, their lives can be destroyed uh, by too much fame. And uh, Joseph, uh, not only did he levitate, but he was a healer, and he could read people's minds. Uh, at a rate that is that seemed almost constant, but he was also famously holy. I mean, he he wasn't just a, uh, a miracle worker. He was an, an honest to God, authentic saintly dude, and uh, so uh, people were interested. They wanted to get advice from him, and some of the people who came for his advice were very distinguished people. One guy would end up the king of Poland, uh, John Waza was his name. And in fact, Joseph told him that you should not, as you want to, become a monk. I want you to go back because you're going to become the, the, the king of Poland and you'll be able to do more good as the king as, uh, than, than otherwise, you see. Uh, the Duke of Brunswick, who was uh, Leibniz, is the fam- famous German philosopher's uh, employer, came to visit. He was a Lutheran. And he heard about Joseph, and boy, did he get blasted uh, by his uh, uh, encounter with Joseph. When he went to visit Joseph in a secret room and watched him uh, say Mass, Joseph suddenly got very upset. He says, I can't break the 
I can't break the Eucharistic wafer. There's somebody in this room that's not a believer. And and he gets all violently upset. And uh, and then suddenly he confronts uh, uh, the Duke. And uh, oh, maybe, maybe I want to be sure about being accurate here. What I know that before he confronts the Duke, he levitates. Joseph levitates. And here's a case of him levitating backwards. Again, to get off or away from something that was distressing him. So... Yes, the fame, uh, and this was that's just a very interesting story in itself. In the end, he came back, the Duke, the following day, and had long conversations with him. It wasn't just, I, th- I would like to say this, it wasn't just that people observed Joseph do amazing things, and they said, all right, he can levitate, no one else can do that, he's got to be worth believing in. It was his ideas as well, and his spiritual impact on people. The phenomena particularly the uh, levitations, were an embarrassment to Joseph. And he prayed constantly, as other saints allegedly prayed to, for them to stop, but he was unable to. Hmm. And which it makes me really wonder about Joseph, that there was something about him that was unique, that it was an involuntary process. But as a result of this, yes, he became famous, and an effect of that fame was that for the rest of his life, uh, the, 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 uh, his superiors in the church kept moving him from one place to another. Mm-hmm. Because it would get too crowded. The minute they would hear that he moved to another town, then people would be coming out from all directions and coming to visit. And there are interesting stories that, you know, it was good for the economy because wherever he was, they started building uh, little hotels for people, and they started selling things. Uh, so the same thing happened at Lourdes, by the way. Uh, but uh, Lourdes stayed one place. Joseph kept moving around. So he was so famous that eventually the church had to make him incognito, and they had to issue rules saying that no one can visit him, No one can talk to him. He can't talk to anybody. He can't send letters out, which is a pity because it would have been interesting if he had written some of his. He did write some of his ideas down. But uh, so in the last phase of his life, where he ended up in uh, Osimo, which is right by the Adriatic. And I've been there, by the way. It's right at the tip of Italy. And at that time, it was just no man's land. And uh, but even there try as they may to keep him hidden in a tiny little hole of a room which he called his uh, forest paradise. I don't think you and I would call it a forest forest paradise the way they describe it. There wasn't even any light half of the year coming in. But he was perfectly happy there. But people came anyway. And they would sometimes, uh, earlier in his career, some of the different towns, they would climb on top of the churches, pull the slates down, hammer holes through the church so that they could watch and, and witness uh, his phenomena and, wit- and witness him. Uh, and so, yes, his fame, uh, in a sense, um, made his life a whole lot more difficult. Yeah. It sounds as if the uh, church fathers were actually somewhat embarrassed by him. They were embarrassed by him, but uh, one of the things that happened was that early on in his career, one uh, religious fun- functionary wrote a letter to the Inquisition and said that there's this guy is walking around in all these towns and he's acting like a messiah. Didn't accuse him of faking levitations, accused him of having a suspicious attitude toward his own phenomena. That's all you had to do. So he was called from uh, where he was in uh, Copertino to uh, uh, to Naples to stand before and explain himself to the Inquisition. And uh, when when he got there, uh, you know, he he was he convinced everybody that look, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to do this. I can't help it. Uh, these flights. And so they questioned him. Uh, Are you proud of yourself? When you have these experiences, what does it make you feel like? All these interesting questions designed 
not to question the reality of the levitations, but to question the nature of his response and his attitude. They were looking to see, was he arrogant? Was he going to use this stuff as a way of starting his own little movement? Remember, the church is struggling at this time to maintain its integrity and its doctrines. It's got enemies on all sides. There's the science, there's the economic problems. Uh, there are the Protestants that want to undermine the church. So what do they do with this uh, strange guy who is both an attraction and could be very dangerous? So, yes, his popularity uh, in the final analysis uh, actually served to increase the plausibility of his phenomenon, because wherever he went, the same thing happened. Uh, and in some places, it, he only lasted in a place called Pietra Rubia for three months because he was so on, on the supernormal ball, so to speak. Things were happening so rapidly, so often. So many people wanted to, to catch him out. They, would, they broke down parts of the church to, to, to watch him. Uh, that he, he, They had to move him out in three, in three months. And then he lasted only three years in the next place, a place called Fossombrone. Never heard of that, right? These are all very <laughs> obscure little towns in, in, in northern Italy. And, uh, and, and then the last time that they got rid of him, moved him around, was in Osimo. And the day he stepped into Osimo, uh, he said, here's where I'm going to die. And I should say this, another feature of, of, of Joseph's uh, paranormal abilities he knew his life backwards and forwards. The older he got, he more he, he just simply knew more uh, in advance. He predicted things. He knew exactly when and where he was going to die. And uh, so anyway, that's the, the response to your question about his mm -hmm. fame. Uh, in a way, it it caused him to to become more famous mm -hmm. because you know when you're moving a guy around, that makes him more interesting. Well, and I gather that the church was really scrutinizing him very carefully because uh, they were concerned about being embarrassed in the event that he was some kind of a phony, either a spiritual phony or some sort of a magician faking phenomena. There, there, there were others at that time, I gather, who were faking stigmatas and the like. That's right. That's right. There were. But I have to say, I don't know of a single instance where anyone suggested that Joseph was faking his, his miracles. They were only concerned, as you rightly said, with his attitude. And uh, so he so he went a second time uh, later on. And I actually went to he had to go to Rome and uh, and that was the second visit to the to the uh, to visit with the uh, uh, the inquisitors. And in that at that particular time, um, he acquitted himself, and then he was told to say Mass uh, at a Church of Liguria, it was known as, and a bunch of nuns and a bunch of inquisitors went to that Mass and watched him levitate. So there's no question about the fact uh, that this guy uh, was uh, doing these strange phenomena. But yes, there, there were, there were, they were surveilling him to, to the very end, but at the same time, uh, there were people that uh, were critical of that, that, that they thought the church uh, dealt with him rather harshly. And you can see that in Bernini's biography, who, mm -hmm. who's independent and very critical of, of the church for, for being so harsh uh, yeah. with This biography is, uh, by Bernini, is the, he's the son of the famous sculptor. Yes, indeed. Uh, sculptor and, uh, and painter and, of course, he's the guy that uh, designed a good part of the cathedral in Rome. Uh, mm -hmm. he, was a, he was an architect as well. Uh, and a very interesting, uh, one of the great artists of, 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 of that period, or of any period, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. So, and, and Bernini himself was, um, this was his last book, I believe, that he wrote. And um, it, it, it's... Um, uh, uh, just one of the things about that about Bernini that I will say that I really appreciate he was aware there was something in the air of the new emphasis on evidence this is the 17th century mm 
And Bernini is continually saying in the course of his narrative, these things I am telling you would be, would be incredible were it not that we have sworn testimony. And then he would present the sworn testimony. Mm -hmm. So this is not some medieval person who is piously blowing up tales and inventing. This is a period of, of, of history where there's an acute growing awareness of the importance of evidence mm -hmm. and that's quite clear in the case of um, of this particular uh, narrative of uh, Joseph's life which is a later one they were earlier mm -hmm. I mean based on uh, Bernini's biography uh, draws upon uh, Archangelo Rosmi's eyewitness um, uh, observations uh, and uh, Roberto Nuti's first biography of Joseph, who was a contemporary of Joseph and lived with him in the same context. So these people knew him, observed him, and were recording uh, as his life as he lived it. And then, there, of course, there were all these letters of different people. Um, uh, there were many, many documents. And finally, it's the, the most uh, valuable source of evidence are the sworn testimonies when it came to the actual canonization process you had to get people who would uh, vouch for the mm -hmm. authenticity of the phenomena uh, and, and this was in a time when swearing meant a lot more than it probably does to people today so uh, I, I don't see any, any leeway for the skeptic here unless you want to just uh, doubt that any kind of historical documentation is valid. Yeah. There's so much of it here, tons of it. Well, I think for many people it would be axiomatic that, uh, as, as David Hume uh, wrote, that people who claim miracles are automatically either uh, fools or liars. Yes, and yet, and, and at the same time, Hume, in, a, in an essay, famous essay on miracles that he wrote, uh, documents examples of miracles that are quite compelling. Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that particular essay. Maybe you haven't read it for a while, but take a look at it. The, all of the stuff, I mean, Hume was honest <laughs> enough to quote eyewitness uh, persons who had seen uh, some of the uh, phenomena so associated with what they called the, the convulsionaries. There was a whole bunch of, of groups that were uh, doing things that are so bizarre and so weird, you, it's you, it's hard to uh, accept as real. But there's overwhelming amounts of evidence for this stuff, and um, Hume had it all in front of him. Mm -hmm. And his only argument was it's a priori impossible. This stuff, yeah. it's nickel the same. The only difference between nickel, I mean, nickel is nothing. He's a hack. Uh, Hume was a great intellect. But Hume put the data there in front of the reader to decide for himself or herself. Uh, unlike Nickel, hasn't the, the slightest bit of intellectual honesty. But even today, in the field of philosophy, there's the school uh, known as naturalism, which mm. su suggests. Uh, and I've spoken to philosophers trained in this tradition, they believe that it's perfectly justifiable to dismiss the whole discipline of parapsychology out of hand because right. it doesn't conform to their notion of what a natural world should be like. Right. Well, it's uh, it's an unfortunate state of uh, being. It's, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's anti-scientific. Uh, it's uh, anti-intellectual and anti-honest, uh, just for the sake of... It, it does baffle me that anyone could hold that, that view. Uh, I can't understand it. Well, at, at the same time, I suppose it's fair to say that the uh, Catholic Church fathers who were evaluating mm -hmm. uh, Joseph of Copertino and eventually beatified him and canonized him had, mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, been influenced by the writings of uh, a person like Francis Bacon in England, who was <laughs> considered the father of empiricism. And, mm -hmm. Right, uh, and it, Bacon himself was also deeply interested in esoteric culture and hermeticism, <laughs> and uh, you know the possibilities that we now think of as parapsychological. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and uh, so. Uh, and, but there's an additional point: the Catholic Church has the benefit of this Roman 
legalistic tradition that everything has to be, you know, there are, there are laws, there are rules, and there's a thing called evidence, and you document things. So, uh, whereas, let's say, I'm convinced that the levitation in the Tibetan tradition must have been just as wild, uh, because all that artwork is there, but they didn't have a tradition of, of, uh, of sanctification, canonization, and a, and a legalistic obsession with documenting uh, every phenomenon of importance. So we should be glad, I suppose, that the church inherited that Romanistic uh, or Roman tradition of legalism, because we've got evidence uh, of, uh, of, of some of this material that we would not have. If we didn't have written eyewitness accounts of Joseph's uh, flights, uh, it would be a totally different story. Uh, now, in, in your book, you have a section where, that you call the parapsychology of religion. And I think this is very interesting because uh, there are so many reports from within the various religious and spiritual traditions of events that uh, would be of interest to parapsychologists, but parapsychologists, for the most part, don't dig into them the way you have. And, but if, if we were to apply parapsychological insights, it might give us, uh, a, a whole new perspective on uh, the history of religions. Well, that is a belief of mine. And I have written a few things to that effect, but I haven't written, and maybe this book that I've written in a sense is an illustration of it. But, uh, I absolutely agree that I'll just say flat out, give me, I'll offer you my view. I believe that with the help of parapsychology, the whole range of it, and co including all consciousness studies, all of the scientific data that we have, it enables us to make sense out of a great deal that we would tend to automatically to dismiss uh, as rationalists and materialists looking at the history of religion. So I'll just take a couple of very obvious things. Uh, we all know uh, parapsychologists who know something about, let's say, the role of belief. The, the, uh, Gertrude Schmeidler uh, coined the phrase, the sheep-goat effect. And the idea there is the more you believe uh, in, inside, the greater likelihood is that you will get a psi, psi effects. And uh, now, belief is a form of faith. It's one, of, it's one of the cornerstones of, of, of all the religious traditions, that there's something going on. There are things going on that we don't have immediate rationalistic, compelling reasons to accept. But if we open ourselves up and believe, but by the way, the word belief is not enough. I think when we believe, we're doing more than just having a, a sort of an abstract cognitive affirmation that something is possible. I think we have to look at the New Testament Greek word for belief, pistis, and that means trust, confidence. So my own suspect, suspicion is that the kind of belief that leads to transformations of behaviors are partly imaginative, partly psychoenergetic. They represent a, a whole disposition of the entire mind and body of a person. Not just a mere thing. Yeah, I believe in God. You know, I believe in miracles. Sure. Now, let's have some coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be a total living belief. Mm -hmm. And parapsychology gives us clues uh, mm -hmm. and tells us that prayer, for example, which is a cornerstone of most religious systems, uh, might work through various parapsychological uh, phenomena or in light of certain parapsychological phenomena that we know of. And I could go on uh, giving examples. Uh, uh, the healing phenomena. I mean, most of the great religions uh, tra uh, traffic in claims of unusual healing abilities. Well, we have lots of data, all kinds, some of it very trivial. It doesn't matter how trivial it is, because if it's the moment you've broken the ice and you're showing that uh, mere intentionality can have physical effects on physical biological systems. We're in another ball game. We're, we have something to learn, some to, something to exp uh, explore. And so we could use that data to revisit claims of religious miracles and religious healings. So yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that, uh, I even think that we can begin to make sense out of the concept 
of a transcendent deity in terms of the parapsychological and consciousness research that we uh, modern folks have, have been doing. Uh, and uh, I intend to write about that more as well, I, I do know that you are one of the editors of a remarkable volume called uh, Irreducible Mind that uh, suggests that we're entering into a post-materialistic world, perhaps a world in which consciousness itself is is fundamental. And from, from that philosophical perspective, uh, it, it offers uh, opportunities to reinterpret not only all of the natural sciences, but religion as well. Well, I, I completely agree with you. And, and also, when we think of the, the totality of so-called religion, and we can move on to the East, uh, I mean, Eastern thinkers talk about consciousness being the divinity uh, and, and, and the gods being manifestations of the uh, of the uh, uh, of consciousness uh, personifications of of of, uh, of the root transcendent one consciousness uh, that Larry Dossi has written a marvelous book called the One Mind. Yes, just a wonderful book. Just case after case of different area, different uh, branches of, uh, and and uh, of human experience, aspects of human experience. That suggest these uh, transcend the underlying transcendent potential of, of human experience. So yes, I'm 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 convinced that in time, and I'm being, you know, if we have time on this planet, <laughs> I'm speaking optimistically now that eventually, uh, science and spirituality, uh, there's no reason why they should ought not to come 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 together in in new and new and very unexpected ways. Mm -hmm. I think that. Uh, science will have to renounce its uh, its dogmatism about uh, the mind, and religion will have to renounce its dogmatisms uh, when they are dogmatic and say that only our religion, I mean, uh, is is the one that's going to provide the uh, the insight into salvation and enlightenment. Uh, I prefer I myself am more of a Hindu uh, than any religion I, and it happened one day I walked into on 71st Street Manhattan uh, uh, to the uh, the Bedan Center and I walked in and I saw on the wall written something that I've never forgotten it said truth this was a quote from the Rig Veda truth is one people well actually it said men but I'll say people call it variously very few words truth is one people call it that was it for me. That was enlightenment. I had it right there in, in the words of the Rig Veda, and I've never changed since then. That is my religious perspective is right in, the, in that phrase. There's one consciousness, one ground of being, and humans, beings, since time began, have been, depending on their culture, their language, their location, uh, their geography, have found their way, had found their own ways to try to connect with that uh, uh, root, root of consciousness. I know a book with that title. <laughs> well, Michael Grosso, what a pleasure to uh, have this discussion with you. It's very inspiring uh, uh, to think about the life of uh, St. Joseph of Copertino and uh, also to uh, combine it with your own philosophical perspective. Thank you so much for being with me. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was my pleasure. And I look forward to future discussions with you as well. Well, I do too.